So welcome everyone. Could you please uh, take a seat or find a spot that is uh, nice to sit? Um, welcome to this last session of today, uh, the third session of today, which is around the work um, made and, and produced together uh, with other people, but made by um, Yuki Kihara, uh, <coughs> and it's called Going Native. Um, so what I, I just wanted to say is that this project has been really long in the making. It started in 2017 uh, when Yuki Kihara was a, a Tolonair van Raalte uh, fellow here. That's a special fellowship that we have around photography specifically. And uh, so she came here and looked at some of our collections and that's where the whole kind of project developed around Dutch constructions of the Pacific. Uh, she came back in 2019 to continue the project, and then, of course, you know what happened. Uh, COVID happened, and so the project was hal halted for, for a bit. And we're very, very happy that we were able, also together with Taking Care, to invite Yuki again as an artist in residence to uh, continue the project and to actually finish the project. As part of this discussion, after this discussion actually, we will all be able to see the work which is on display on this floor. Uh, so it's not very far to walk, so it's uh, easy. <laughs> no stairs or anything. Um, and um, so um, I'm, I'm really pleased that this, um, this is possible, has been made possible. I think the work is really quite um, uh, interesting and also, even though it has been long in the making, very, um, uh, well, a contemporary project dealing with some of the issues that we have been discussing today uh, and that we will be discussing th uh, throughout this um, uh, meeting. Um, I think one of the three things I want to draw out here are uh, issues to do with uh, possibilities of kin uh, cons constructing kinships, uh, how these are um, made throughout people's lives. Uh, also, the importance of performance and how performance can create knowledge and how uh, the relationship of performance <laughs> to also a certain um, responsibility that people carry. Uh, and then the third point is also, I think, really important, is looking at the silences because certain things are not said. And that's definitely important, and perhaps in the discussion I can uh, point at that more uh, precisely, but some things that are really related to uh, some of the Dutch constructions of the Pacific, Pacific are not talked about. Uh, so I want to, um, Yuki has asked to first start the discussion with a sm uh, short uh, trailer film, uh, and then each of the uh, protagonists uh, that who feature in the, in the work, in the artwork, are also going to discuss and um, talk about their experience and what their relationship is to the Pacific and to the project. Hello. Well, perhaps we can talk a little bit uh, more about how the work uh, was done. It was shot in different, it's a video work, it was shot in different locations that are significant to uh, Dutch history and Dutch colonial history as well. Um, and each of these locations have a very specific link to the Pacific culture that uh, the, the video work is talking about. Um, it was also, uh, we worked together closely with the museum, of course, uh, so there's also some uh, elements that really kind of connect back to the museum and to the museum collections uh, as well. I'm hoping I have to continue. <laughs> Just perhaps, yeah, perhaps I can just briefly introduce uh, everyone. So, the 
first person is Yuki Kihara, that most of you will know. Um, and Michiel uh, uh, Tegeler, second person. Um, Harry Lodder, third one. And next to me is uh, Mirte Hazes. Yep. Testing. Um, so while the, 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 the video is going to... Ik denk dat het wat er gewoon een, een initiële liefde is. Ja, ik denk dat het uh, heel veel voorkomt dat mensen na de hele cultuur het aan had. En in ieder geval mijn hart is, uh, is aan alle wijze van. Nou, ik heb dus een De ene familie is Bruce Murray en de andere familie is Ismaël van Life Murray. Aya, Aya, la otele Hawaii, Ea, Ea, Ama, Ea, Ima, Okele, Ea. Aya. Testing. Fatsa la fatsa le paia malu malu le ofio. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody in between. Uh, my name is Yuki Kihara. I'm an interdisciplinary artist, and I'm also representing the New Zealand Pavilion at the current Venice Biennale. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, Museum Volker Kunde um, and the National Museum of World Cultures for um, uh, you know, inviting me back to revive the project. Um, of uh, Going Native, which, uh, like Wonu said, first began in 2017, but it was uh, halted because of, uh, due to the COVID. Um, and um, on the occasion of my presentation at Venice, um, you know, I was able to uh, you know, fly back over here to Light and to uh, revive the project. And then for that, I want to uh, uh, share my uh, thanks and my gratitude to all the Going Native participants um, who were able to um, revive the project with uh, so much enthusiasm because you know sometimes when you drag a project on for six months, you know, for six years, you know, you kind of get bored with it. But you know, you guys were able to just come back into back into the game just like that. So I'm really, really grateful for your participation. Um, uh, a little bit about the uh, Going Native uh, exhibition. So um, the Going Native exhibition is currently taking place right next to the Japan Gallery. And as you know from my name, I have a Japanese name. Uh, so my father's Japanese and my mother's Samoan, and I moved back to Samoa to be uh, with my family. So I live with my mom and my auntie. Um, and my studio is in the basement, and I've been living there with my family for over the past 11 years. Um, and um, so back in 2016, um, as uh, Wonu said, I was invited here uh, on a photography project because I work uh, with a lot of um, uh, colonial photography. Uh, you know, that's the, the critique and the basis of my practice is about uh, representation and who's holding the lens and the, and the power dynamics around that. Um, and then so, um, I don't know how many hours it took me from uh, Aotearoa, uh, 
you know, New Zealand to, to here in the Netherlands, but on my first day I arrived here, the museum put me in the pavilion uh, where they host uh, all their guest scholars, like at, at, at over there. And then, uh, so I was upstairs and I opened up my window and I started hearing, Kamate, Kamate, Kaora, Kaora. I was thinking like, hold on a minute, I just left Aotearoa. And then I hear like the All Blacks haka or, or the ceremonial war dance being chanted just outside my, my room. Like, who are these people? And then, and then so I went down and have a look and a bunch of like white Dutch people, you know, performing, you know, the, the, the Maori um, haka. And I said to, to Wanu, Wanu, do you know what's happening over there? And they said, oh, so this is, you know, this is a project, you know, that, uh, about the Waka project that, you know, that came out of uh, this exchange that took place uh, between the museum and Te Papa, which uh, Merita and uh, Wonu will, will talk about. Um, and I thought, like, oh, great, because, you know, I was kind of feeling homesick around that time. And, um, you know, and I attended, you know, just about, you know, most of the, the practices that you guys had in the afternoon. Um, and then also, Wonu, you introduced me to uh, INSOS, um, uh, who is a West Papuan uh, community organizer. Um, so I kind of found like a home for myself here. Um, it's strange that I'm in the middle of Europe and I kind of find traces of the Pacific, you know, in a country that I know nothing about. Um, and then, um, and then starting from um, engaging with, with the Waka group, I wanted to see whether there are other traces of, of the Pacific here in the Netherlands. And then I came across uh, Harry and Mikael. Um, so now I'll uh, have, hand it over to our going native uh, participants. Oh, okay, where does the title come from? Well, obviously, you know, when you, when you say somebody is going native, for me, it's really derogatory because it means that it's somebody so-called, quote unquote, civilized, going primitive, um, you know, as if like, you know, they're going through a process of being in touch with nature. And then, so I kind of find it really derogatory. So I wanted to kind of turn that, uh, word going native on its head and actually apply a, another kind of context in which we could understand cross-cultural engagement. Um, and then so I'm really surprised that um, all the participants here were okay with the title, uh, this very provocative title. Um, but uh, let's um, have them speak for themselves. So Mikael, do you want to talk about, um, yeah, about, you know, your... Uh, yeah, your work as a musician and engaging with uh, didgeridoo and the Arnhem Land people. Yeah, uh, so I'm Michiel Teigler. Uh, uh, in 1993, uh, I was at Park Pop Festival in The Hague, and up came a band called Joffe Yindi. Uh, at that time, they had a MTV uh, hit called Treaty. And uh, I was just in front of that stage, and this man was playing this instrument, and it went from my eardrums straight to my heart. And at that time, I realized that my uh, world shifted. And so I dumped my girlfriend, sold my house, quit my job, <laughs> and uh, started playing on the streets uh, throughout Europe. It came back all together. I've got a house and a wife and a child, so <laughs> it's <laughs> it was in the rough years. And uh, so, yeah, then, then uh, I was traveling throughout Europe playing uh, techno parties with my didgeridoo. And while I was doing this, I constantly had in the back of my head, like, I like this, this is my voice, but it's not what I initially heard at that park pop festival. Uh, at that time, uh, there was not much internet and stuff, so it was very hard to, to collect information about this instrument. And uh, so then in 2003, I got invited uh, by the Yoffa Yindi Foundation to attend the Garma Festival, which is held at Gurkula in Northeast Arnhem Land. And so I did, and then I had uh, master classes, five days of master classes with uh, very important men who are both deceased unfortunately, and uh, officially you need a permit, but I was able to <coughs> stay two weeks longer, and uh, then I was camping in this family's backyard, and all of a sudden they told me, uh, we're going to adopt you, and uh, I tried to keep it short, but <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was like, okay, uh, they adopted us, they adopted me and my girlfriend, 
who's now my wife, so we're going according to kinship there. And uh, yeah, and then I came back in Europe and I did my, my festival tours uh, and I just looked around at all those hippie uh, didgeridoo festivals and I didn't see <laughs> any Yorngu people, I didn't see Yorngu instruments, I didn't hear any Yorngu uh, music. So I thought that needs to change. So I started a business, <laughs> very small business. <laughs> and uh, I promised myself two things. Uh, the first thing is that one third of what I make a year goes back into community-based art centers throughout Arnhem Land in the hope that uh, if I make money, I can buy instruments. If I buy a lot of instruments, <laughs> they supply me with good material and I can, and hopefully, you know, we can grow a little bit together like that. And the other thing uh, is what I promised myself is that whenever I have the time to uh, advocate for the tradition of the didgeridoo, uh, which is uh, from the top end of Australia, and uh, uh, mainly Yerdaki is from Northeast Arnhem Land, uh, then I will. So <laughs> that's basically why I'm here, because I uh, can give a voice to uh, the tradition, the musical tradition uh, focused <laughs> on the didgeridoo, which is only a small part of the musical tradition. And uh, yeah. So that's why I took the opportunity. Sorry. Aloha. Um, my name is Harry Kavika Kumaka Ekala Lodder. Um, I've been dancing hula for 42 years now. Um, I came to start dancing hula. My mom's from Indonesia. My dad's Dutch. And um, in Indonesia, they danced hula and played Hawaiian music in the 30s and 40s. And because Hawaiians came to Indonesia and started playing music, and some of the guys and girls stayed over there, so they started uh, playing music with the local people. But because Indonesia was a Dutch, um, Dutch, Dutch Indies, um, a Dutch colony, so when Indonesia became independent in 1948, everybody who was linked to the Netherlands needed to leave, and a lot of these people who were mixed Indonesian. Even though my mom was uh, pedigree in Indonesian, she was married to a Dutch guy, so she needed to leave. But a lot of people in those days danced hula and played Hawaiian music. So they took this subculture of Hawaiian hula and music from Indonesia to the Netherlands, or they went to California or Australia. And I, so when I started dancing, I was 17 because my sisters danced. And uh, in the beginning, it was just... Uh, just copying, right? Just just copying the dances. And I started dancing hula at a time that even in Hawaii there were not many men dancing. Um, that kind of revived in the 19s, in the, in the 90s of the last century. Um, so it was hard. And even now, um, it's um, when I dance hula in, in the Netherlands, um, most or rather go to a workshop, I'm most of the time one of the few guys who dance hula. And it's Interesting because if you look at the other uh, Polynesian cultures like um, Maori, um, Tahiti, Tonga, Samoa, all men dance. And the only part of Polynesia where they cannot look at guys dancing as being feminine is Hawaii, which is a pity because hula, the Hawaiian hula used to be only for men. But after the colonization of, of, of Hawaii, um, it was banned. and. Um, for a while, it was just merely women dancing. So, uh, but I'm still dancing. I we started a hello. A friend of mine from Hawaii he ordained me to teach. He said, you know what you know, you're supposed to share. And just, just, just I wanted to share, but now I had to share it in in a hello. Hello is how I work for school. So we did started that ten years ago. And uh, for me, hula is not just a dance. It's it's a way of life, and there's so much depth in it. In Hawaiian hula, um, so just keep doing it, and uh, I hope I'll still do it for a long, long time. So, uh, thank you. Um, <coughs> well, my name is Mirta, and um, my journey here started in uh, 2012 when I became a student here at Leiden University. Um, and I became a member of the uh, student rowing club Njord. And uh, at one time, I saw this, these your people coming in and they performed the haka. Obviously, I didn't know what it was then. Um, and I was like, what, what's happening within this student rowing club? Um, so they have, there were open practices, so I joined one. And 
I think, well, they talked a bit about the project first, and then we were all going to do a haka, and I was like, what are we doing? And the first time you do it, it's like, okay, hmm, and you have to, like, scream or, well... So it was a bit like, what's happening? But then at the end of the pr first practice, I was like, oh, this is really interesting. Uh, I want to I wanna join. Um, so the project originally started in 2010. Uh, there was an exhibition here at the museum about uh, Maori. And the former director of the museum, Stephen Engelsman, he uh, wanted something permanent as well for the museum here. Um, so he's talking with this arts organization in New Zealand, Toy Maori. Uh, and he asked them if it would be possible to build a waka for the museum here. And waka is the Maori canoe. It's oh, you can't see it now on the on the picture, but it's the uh, the Maori canoe. Um, uh, so they uh, they were talking about that, but then the the Maori over there they said, well, it is the the waka are not. It's not something you just put in the museum and just showcase it. It's it's a living thing, so it actually needs to be taken care of, and it needs to be in the water, and people need to paddle it. Um, so they they asked the student rowing club, "Are you guys interested in a project like this?" Um, and they said yes. Well, like I I brought two people here as well, so or well three actually. So we have Kos here and Laura Kos, who's been here from the beginning, and Ella in, in the back as well, taking pictures, <laughs> part of the crew as well. And oh, I see another one just arrived, Thomas. <laughs> so um, uh, Coase was the president of the New York Club at, the, at that time. And uh, they said, well, this is an interesting project. Let's go for it. We'll see. And he, he didn't know where who'd bring him or the club. But um, yeah, so they started and a, a bunch of uh, Maori came over here to teach them to, well, they first were like, okay, these Dutch students, are they, what are they going to do, drink beer in the waka or something? Um, so they, they came over here and they talked with them for a long time and they taught them about the, the well, the, the Maori, um, how do you say, things that, well, the uh, tikanga for paddling the waka and everything that came with it. Um, yeah, so it, the whole project is about um, showing people here in Leiden and for in Europe, they call it like a waka for Leiden, a waka for Europe to how do you say, like, share the culture with others and teach people about it. Um, yeah. Do you want me to tell more now, or...? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I think um, we, we will open up for questions, but one of the things I wanted to say is that um, what kind of connects these three personal stories and connections to the Pacific is a certain amount of serendipity, but really taking serendipity seriously, because each of you has been in some way kind of called or has been touched by something, and then has kind of taken the responsibility to take it further, not just to kind of push it aside or just let it be. And that's also where the kind of taking care aspect uh, comes in, and also the guardianship that each of you seems to feel, the responsibility that you feel in um, uh, sharing aspects, but also perhaps um, really incorporating it and and having uh, letting things live um, or going their course without being arrogant as well, not, not kind of holding on to things, but also sharing them in a responsible way. Uh, so I think that's one of the things that also next to the kind of kinship issues and so on that uh, connects these um, these things. So perhaps we could just first go uh, for a, a small uh, round of uh, questions. Uh, and then I believe that perhaps uh, Harry, <laughs> he's not sure, <laughs> might want to um, talk a little bit more about hula. And um, also people are invited to join in if they wish to and if they want to. So uh, first uh, questions. <laughs> No questions. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Hi there. I um, I'm coming out of uh, North America, <laughs> uh, institutionally speaking, and so the idea of going native for me has a resonance with the problem of pretendianism and the problem of consuming cultures, especially indigenous cultures. And so I, I appreciate that you talk about it as sharing culture, 
but then it makes me question, is it sharing or is it consuming? How is it different from Germans who do powwows? Sorry, that makes sense. Super pointed because... Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, yeah, yeah you can... Yeah. Well, maybe uh, for me, the sharing is that uh, at the Garma Festival in 2004, uh, there was uh, an instrument revealed to the general public called the Dardalal, which is a funeral didgeridoo with uh, kangaroo bone and cockatoo feathers. And then in 2014, uh, the custodians of this instrument decided uh, that it was time to make 10 of these instruments and spread them around uh, the globe uh, for, <coughs> sorry, uh, to people uh, who they trust with this instrument. So I received one Dardalal, uh, which is a very sacred uh, Yiritya uh, Yirdaki. And I have this in my house. And uh, I use it when I have lectures or like I did uh, a Yiraki exhibition uh, with Georges Petitjean in the Museum Opal in uh, Switzerland. And then I have this instrument and I can say like, you want to know what a didgeridoo is? This is a didgeridoo. You know, it's not a fun mocking thing. And I don't play it. I just show it to people with pride. And so, therefore, I think it's uh, sharing for me with uh, those people, with them, because they give it to me, because they trust me to show it with respect. So, yeah. So, in that sense, I, I don't know if it answers your question, but... Well, I, I think it partly, I think it definitely answers a, a part of the question. Uh, and I think, oh, that was a big concern, I think, uh, for us as a museum as well, um, in terms of uh, how these things could be seen as cultural appropriation. But what distinguishes each of these um, connections with the Pacific is that each of them have received um, the blessings of the people who uh, taught them uh, certain things. And so they have always, re they have, each of them have received the blessing to also share uh, certain things. And not share everything, because there are, I can specifically talk about, because that's what I'm most familiar with, with the Waka project. Um, there are certain things that can be, for example, uh, shown, certain hakas that can be shown, but they cannot necessarily be taught because they have not received the blessing to do so. Um, and as I think it's this kind of constant relationship going back and forth that makes it different from people performing a powwow because that's something that they probably do. I don't know these people, but <laughs> you know, that they, I kind of assume that they probably do it on their own accord and have not had this kind of constant relationship. And this, this is really what, this, uh, typify, uh, what typifies these types of relationships. They constantly go back and forth. I respect that answer, but the question mm -hmm. still, who has the authority to say you're allowed to share something? And second, what is the personal drive to then want to be the medium to distribute? Can you don't I? have to answer it. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, I can try to answer yeah, yeah, the second yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. It's a question that I hope we can really sit through. Yeah. It doesn't have like a five-minute or two-minute response. No, it doesn't. No, but I, I can very talk a little bit about my personal... Um, so what I was talking about, I, I heard from it first and I saw it and I was like, okay, this is very interesting. I want to learn more about this. Um, and my personal drive is not being in the spotlight or anything like that. That's not it at all. It's just um, learning about this culture. And uh, well, so for us, uh, a lot of us each year go to New Zealand, to Aotearoa, and to um, we, we're there with the people over there and they learn us more. And it's, well, I think they, um, they gave us so much in terms of, or me personally, I made a personal growth and I learned so much about their culture and also things that are not specifically Maori culture or things, but the, um, the love they had and the openness and the sharing and that is what grasped me most, like the um, welcoming of them, not knowing me, like in their house and to their culture and they just wanted to share everything with us and were teaching us about a lot of things and I think that's, that is for me one of the things that I want to share with others as well, like 
to be open and to uh, be giving, I think, more like that. Yeah, there's uh, for the didgeridoo, the yerdaki, there's a, a website called Yerdaki Dawu, uh, which uh, is an interview with a lot of uh, yerdaki masters about what is the instrument, what is, it, what is it about, and what do you think about Dutch people making, in, of, uh, uh, outside people making these instruments, outside people teaching these instruments, uh, outside people playing and performing, and things like that. And so all the masters were interviewed with uh, these questions. I helped translate this website into Dutch because I thought it was a voice of uh, the traditional masters. And so I don't basically, uh, in my performances, like I'm just a didgeridoo rock star. I'm not, <laughs> I, you know, I like, to, I like to make my own music and uh, I, I don't play traditional songs because in, in Yorongu society, it's quite ridiculous if I would play traditional songs because it doesn't have any relation uh, with... Uh, the, I don't have... I don't know if the song subject is my auntie or my brother, you know, I don't know. I don't speak the language well enough to understand the singing. I don't dance well enough to do the dance. And without all these things, it's ridiculous to just play this rhythm. So I don't do these kind of things. Uh, but I try to... What, what my role, I think, in the wider didgeridoo community is to keep saying like, hey, listen, it's from there. And there are certain things they would like us to do and certain things they don't like us to do. So I'm more like doing this in, inside the, the community, the didgeridoo community, just pointing out like, hey, go to this website and see if the people agree if you do healings, you know? They should do healings. And then, well, if you read in between the lines, maybe you stop giving the true healings. I, I think that's also really what this work does, really kind of question this kind of uh, very opaque boundary. Um, and I hope, I mean, Yuki can probably explain better. Um, I hope this also kind of provokes uh, thoughts and ideas about exactly these boundaries and the, about the things that you are pointing at. Can I address? Because when I started hula, dancing hula, it was, like I said, it was just copying. I was taught by from someone from Hawaii. <clears throat> and I, w I would take workshops from Hawaiian kumuhula. Um, and they would say in the beginning, okay, people want to learn my dances, they learn from me. And it only from me. But over the years, it kind of changed. Uh, Kumuhula would come and say, oh, please share this, because in Hawaii, people think, oh, people, you're, from, you're from Hawaii, you dance hula. But that's not the case. A lot of people in Hawaii, they have to work two, three, four jobs to make ends meet. Hula is not on their radar. It's not their, their priority. So even in Hawaii, a lot of people who dance hula are mixed people. Some people have no Hawaiian blood. If you go way back, of course, 90% of the Hawaiians passed away due to the influence of Western world. So a lot of gaps have been in, in the culture. And now they say we are glad that people from other countries like to learn and, and, and save our culture. And I must say that over the last few years, of course, in Hawaii, there's a revival of hula and more and more people, even people from Hawaiian descendancy and Hawaiian blood, they dance hula. But um, they do say, you know what, we do appreciate that people in other countries um, want to learn our culture. We, as a halal, we are learning halal. We're not much of a performance halal. We won't. We, we do performances because we have to show what we do. But we do a lot of Hawaiian protocol. There's, I'm not going to down, down talk to them, but there's groups in, in the Netherlands who dance hula. They call them hula groups. But they learn from YouTube. And you cannot learn a dance. A hula is uh, not just a dance. It's a way of life. And um, I really like it. And, but I, I'm not pretending to be Hawaiian. I, I, won't, I will never be Hawaiian. Um, but with the utmost respect and all my friends. I have more friends in Hawaii than I have on this side of the world. So Harry, it's, Harry it's, do you want to talk about your dance lineage? Well, so... Um, when I started dancing, they didn't talk about lineage. My first kumu, I didn't even know she was a kumu. When you, have to, when you are a kumu hula in Hawaii, you have to go through uniki, which is a right, and, and then you're, you're allowed to teach. There's different ways of being a teacher. You can do a puka. A puka means that you are ordained uh, to teach hula, and then you don't go through the right of uniki. So when I learned 
uh, my first hulas from um, a woman from uh, Makakilo in Hawaii. We didn't talk about kumu or whatever. She just taught us dances. And then only later I found out what her lineage is. And so when I took a, a workshop from her um, kumu, it felt like coming home to, a, to a, um, um, a dance style that I was so accustomed to. So um, I always... I'm not to say pretend that's my lineage, but in a way that's my lineage of the Auntie Joan Lindsay. And people will um, recognize the style of dancing we do. And like I said, we're not pretending to be Hawaiian. And most of my students are um, Dutch Indonesian, or I have two students from, from, from the States who dance in, in Halau in the, in the States. Um, we're doing it with the most respect. And Going to Hawaii, we sometimes perform in Hawaii, and, and they, they think we're, we're doing a, a good job. And like I said, if we do at least a little of a good job, then I'm, I'm happy. Um, but it, 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 I, I know where you, where I, I can believe where you've come from, and I, I get, I wouldn't say annoyed, but I get um, upset if I see people dancing hula, and I think, you don't know what you're doing, because that's... that's um, Downgrading the hula, you making it commercial, you make it uh, entertainment, and that's totally not not what it is. Not in my heart, and not in my hello. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for this. Is, does it work? Yes. Um, one general uh, point: uh, the, uh, going native has always been a problem for anthropologists like me, right? For a long time, for, for, for ever since the discipline started. And, and, and on the one hand, it has to do with a kind of, what you could call an epistemic violence of keeping the other out, as it were, right? Because classical anthropology worked like that. On the other hand, there has always been this fascination of, of, of you know, someone who actually knew from the inside out was, the better anthropologist, or maybe an inviolable anthropologist. That's not what I want to, I mean, and I'm just signaling this tension that has been present there. But I'd like to share two quick personal experiences. One was uh, that as a secondary school, it scared, it scared me. Then when I had to, the, the privilege to attend uh, the transfer of the waka to the museum uh, when it was done, I talked to one of the uh, Maori who, who made the transfer. And I asked him, how do you feel? I mean, this was long after it had been done. They had done a haka, they, they, they invested in that ritual performance. And I asked him, how do you feel? He said, well, you know, I'm calming down right now. Right? I, I, I was totally worked up. I wasn't doing war or anything, but I was totally worked up when I was doing this. And now I'm, you know, going back to my more or less academic self, as he said to me. Uh, both of these examples, I think, <clears throat> show something that goes beyond either sharing or consuming, as, as Juno wanted to put on the agenda, because uh, th it shows something about establishing relationships that I think um, work beyond whatever the notion of native refers to. Uh, and I think that is quite important, right? It's about relation rather than what the native classifies. Um, and I think it's quite important to keep that in mind when we think about these things. I maybe want to understand a little bit better what you mean by consuming. Because it sounds like when you're consuming something, it's a bad thing. Yeah? And I wonder when we, what we offer here in the museum, yeah, I think 
maybe 80% of the visitors are just consuming the museum and not going deeper into something, yeah? And so, um, yeah, I, I wonder if um, consuming is something bad or, yeah. Okay, for me, I feel that the role of a museum of this kind is really doing two things at once. One, speaking to the people whose heritage is evoked by the objects here. And the other is having the um, experience with difference that then enriches your life because you encounter <coughs> that your norms are not the norm in other parts of the world. That it's the differences that you grow from, right? I'm totally on board with that. But then there's something, there's another element about uh, cultural productions that are used and taken, and I think this is the extractive nature question coming out, where um, what is being consumed is a titillating experience that um, is about taking on another identity or culture. And I, I'm talking very specifically out of admittedly a North American academic yeah. context, um, you know, where, uh, where colleagues, you know, adopt uh, and steal resources on the basis of saying they are indigenous. And it's out of a very specific context that I know is probably not a problem here in the US. I mean, uh, sorry, <laughs> I forgot where I am. I forgot where I am, sorry, that's probably not a problem in Europe. Um, so, uh, this is a North American settler colonial problem, uh, and I know that it's a very culturally specific problem. So other, um, you know, cultural productions talk about consumption too. I, I don't know if you've seen the movie Get Out. <laughs> the opening scenes of the woman who will like then um, seduce the man to who then like get his brain, right? <laughs> um, the opening shots are about food and consuming, right? And about taking culture, taking the soul and spirit of somebody and making them into a form that you can mold as you wish. And then what you're doing is you're creating empty vessels out of people and that you're picking and choosing what heritage forms you like and what you don't like. And so that's, that's the things that I'm wary about. I also recognize you can't just holistically present this is the whole culture and everything about it because I really feel that culture is diffuse among the different people who are in that culture. That's why I'm asking who has the authority, you know? Um, uh, so yeah, no, these are all like troubling answers. There's no easy answer. But I do think that these are the kinds of questions that we should be thinking about. <laughs> Can that, yeah. <laughs> Perhaps you want to reply? Yeah, to, to come back, I think, to like who has the authority. Uh, with, while the, 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 the interviews were made for this Yerakida website, which, was, uh, which is a voice of traditional uh, Yeraki masters, is that not everybody agrees with each other. Yeah. You know? You know? Um, perhaps before there are any more questions, uh, I also want to kind of situate this because I think it's really important to situate this, this in the Netherlands. We hold a collection of about 75,000 objects from Oceania. 50,000 of those are from Western New Guinea. And then you come with this project, which shows connections to places that are not connected <laughs> to Western New Guinea. And why is this connection to Western New Guinea? because of Dutch colonization. And so this is, I think, something that is really important also in this project, and which Yuki uh, has acknowledged in the work that, that is uh, on display. Uh, it's also, it talks also about the silences that Dutch society, that Dutch people, Dutch history, uh, does not necessarily acknowledge. And this is very important as well in acknowledging these kind of, even the people make all these personal connections, which are very valuable, but as a kind of society on its, on, as a whole, uh, there are some kind of um, gaps in the kind of uh, connections that are being made. Yes, 
I immediately see it. <laughs> Insos, Insos wants to say something. Yeah, I'll whisk my poor sister there. Okay, hi everybody. <laughs> um, actually, what uh, Woni is saying is, um, is spot on. So, because we as a people, we are um, like, this is the legacy of Dutch colonialism. We were colonized so many hundreds of years. And then <clears throat> my um, family, they fled to the Netherlands. We are here now 60 plus years. And still, I have to, and I work in a school, I have to explain to everybody that I'm not from Suriname, and I'm not from Curaçao, and I'm not from Africa. And they can name all the countries, Brazil, but I'm, nobody knows about Papua. So I still have to talk about that. Um, and then in the museum, there is a lot of things. Now, a lot of my family members don't like the museum because we see our stuff. It's here, it should be in our country. So we see things that are like uh, disconnected from the people uh, who are the original owners of that culture. And it's displayed in a way um, that, that, that is the vision of the curators, sorry, no intention, <laughs> not, nothing wrong. But it's, it's, it's the vision of how you think um, it should be displayed. And I can have a, a small example is when uh, Wonu took um, me and my family to the depot where you have all these um, artifacts um, and it's called artifacts because in the Western eye, it's an artifact. So I took my, my father went there and um, he's a really like, he comes from a village and um, he fled to the Netherlands in the 60s. Um, he had to refrain himself from beating up people because he was called like, oh, do you want to eat my head? Do you want to chop off my head? When he was trying to make a living. And he worked for the Dutch government as well. Um, and these things are what formed him, and he like, told about his culture to uh, his children. Um, and then we went to the depot, and of course, Bonu said, don't touch anything if you want to see something. She was wearing gloves, she could take it out and would show it to us. And we were walking, and I was keeping an eye on my father, because he's a little bit ADHD, as like, <laughs> really, oh, okay, here you would call it ADHD. In our family, it's normal. People are like that. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> there was like one second I didn't look. I was, I was listening, listening to <laughs> Bono, and then I turned my back, and then all of a sudden I heard, hey, look at this. Yeah, I know this. And he took out a fishing net, and he started swinging it about like, this is what, and he came, he went back to his culture and his days when he was a young boy, in the, in the village, where they, and he was holding it the way they used to hold it. It's a, a tool for him to fish. So it, it, it's here in a, in a depot. Um, so that's the difference from a native perspective as opposed to the Western perspective, where you would say, hey, this looks nice like that. And we would say, it's an, why would you have a fishing net over there? It's, it doesn't say anything about the, th the thing. So my father's not banned from the museum, but <laughs> we're always it was, careful. It, it was beautiful. <laughs> it was beautiful. We are very careful if we take him along. No, but it's... Um, <laughs> no, we, we pay respect to, you know, our culture is still there. Because in our homeland, that culture is being destroyed by the new colonizers, namely Indonesia. <laughs> and the Dutch handed over our country to the Indonesians who are now having a silent genocide. So the culture that is here preserved comes back from centuries as opposed to the culture that is over there that is destroyed. People are not allowed to wear their own stuff. It has to be plastic, painted. It has to be like the Japanese people think it should be and they cannot be themselves. Um, 
So that's kind of my uh, two cents to this story. But um, for the native, I think going native is, um, I think it's a good title, Yuki, because this is what native people and indigenous people see happening everywhere. If I would come here with a Volendam costume, people would laugh at me. And if other people take our attire and perform things, so how does that look to us? So it's different. I must say, from the Maori uh, uh, project, where I have also been um, well engaged because of my cousin, from the beginning, um, I know and I heard from them that they were the ones picked out. So they didn't, uh, they were just uh, you know, being themselves. And the Maori were looking for uh, guards to have their treasure, their cultural treasure, taken care of. And they saw that Njord, the student group, had like the same um, cultural, um, you know, the way that they could, they have like a hierarchy in their student group, which is what they were looking for. So they were looking specifically for people who could do that job for them. So in that sense, I think it's a, there's a difference between um, the Maori project and the other musicians, dancers. There's a difference. Just in, in, in adding to that, the, the reason why I decided to do this project is because when one who approached me to do this fellowship, um, and I came here and I looked around and going, well, who is the audience for this work? It's the Dutch audience. Um, and then, um, I don't know if you walk down down the road, but like the first thing you can encounter, but the Pacific is more on a poke. You know, like that's the, that's the only thing that people know here about, about the Pacific. Um, and then I thought that, well, if I'm really going to get that Dutch audience and like really nail it, then I can't just put a nice photograph. I, I, I kind of felt like, perform because I'm an interdisciplinary artist, I, I, I work in a, a, a lot of different mediums, and I kind of felt that the power of performance, especially being performed by the Dutch to the Dutch people, would really fuck them up in the head. And then, because what we all want as artists is for the audience to be self-reflective, right? And then, so I'm hoping that when the audience goes to see the Goy Native exhibition, that the Dutch people see themselves being reflected through another culture. Um, and then to begin engaging, what is this? Why, why are they performing specific things? And then begin to unravel this, um, you know, long, long history of VOC. I mean, New Zealand, you know, yeah, you know, all these three places, Australia, Hawaii, and Aotearoa, these are all white settler colony um, countries, right? And then so while the Europeans went to the Pacific, you know, extracting resources, they were sending out their white settlers, right? And then they sent their white settlers so that they can populate and dominate. And then so that the white upper class can go and control the white lower class and the, and the natives. And so that's always been the dynamic and continues to do so. And then so by me, a Samoan, doing a project about non-indigenous people going native, for me, in a way, it's about reclaiming the narrative about the Pacific. Um, and, 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 um, and then I actually shared um, the excerpts of the video to some of my friends in these three countries. So I, I've, I've got lots of indigenous friends. Um, and then so I've um, showed um, you know, each of your videos to Australian Aboriginal artists, Kanaka Maori, Tangata Fenua, you know, Maori people. And then, um, you know, at first it's like, why are they ripping us off? Like da 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 da. That's the first thing is just wait, watch it. I said they watch the documentary, so that's why you all need to go and go watch the documentary. <laughs> um, and then, um, and they were amused and also stunned because the consensus of all my artist friends said to me, and a lot of them are hardcore activists, they're at the front taking the bullet. 
They said, how is it that these Dutch people appreciate our culture when the white settlers don't? Because the white settlers are always trying to marginalize them, you know? But why is it that they, you know, th you know these Europeans he here, you know, can't treat our culture, you know, why can't, why can't the white settlers treat, you know, our culture like, the, like these uh, Dutch people? So I thought it was really interesting, and now they all want me to show the work in these countries, so I can actually, so, so I can supposedly like show the white settlers how to treat indigenous culture, because this is an example of what they should be doing. Um, but I'm not saying that I'm giving the white people a pass <laughs> at all. This is not a pass, because they've got a lot to answer for. But I feel like there is something here in their engagement that perhaps offers us a clue, not an answer, but a clue of how can um, cross-cultural engagement can be taken further. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but I kind of felt like there's something here that maybe that we could look at. And then so I've decided that um, Going Native was gonna be an ongoing project. And then so the next project I'm gonna do is gonna be in Japan um, and filming Samoan, uh, Japanese people performing Samoan dances. So anyway, uh, Kuz, yeah. you want to say something? Thank you. Um, thank you all for your for your beautiful stories as well. Um, it's just amazing to hear, and I think it's a, it's a beautiful discussion to have. And your work, Yuki, is, is amazing to to start this up and then to have this discussion throughout Europe. Um, if we talk about intent or where this comes from, it's a question that still resonates with me. Um, I was a really, really, really white student 12 years ago. I'm still really, really white, by the way. Uh, that doesn't change, uh, but I had no idea. And the beauty is that, um, yes, we were picked, but it was a really personal connection. So it wasn't something that had to be gained. No, they would do it if the connection was really there. It's a connection from heart to heart, based on individuals within our group uh, and in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Not just anybody came over, but elders came over, uh, so Hekunu Kumai, famous waka builder, um, Juana Davis, Joe Conrad, uh, Robert Gable, all uh, great names within Maori culture who were not just here to do this thing, but to, you know, they had the eyes of their entire culture upon them as well. And the driving force behind this is, is love, because the way they went about this it was not like, show us what you can do. You know, it was not an academic Western style of, you show us what you can do and then maybe we can go ahead. No, immediately from the first day onward when we start having conversations, it was a open, fragile, um, how do you say, fragile? Yeah, for, there was a lot of vulnerability. Um, and that just immediately opened up the floor for us as well to like, wow. This resonates something inside that I have never felt here in the Netherlands, besides maybe with my family. This is such a way of going about each other as, as people from all the way on the other side of the globe. And we're here and after one day, I have a feeling that we're family. Because you're, you're hitting a nerve, you're hitting something really pure human uh, that I've missed. And that just woke up in my head like, wow. This is so special. This is how we're supposed to be go about each other. And yeah, there will always be people to use something to better themselves. Because that's also part of human being, I think. Um, but that driving force of trusting each other and having love for, their, uh, for each other and the culture, that's what drives us forward. There's nothing else. Just the pure beauty of it and the purity of it, yeah. So that's what I wanted to say. One of the interesting um, things that I remember, Mikael, you told me, you know, during our interview, is that by engaging in another culture, it makes you want to learn more about your own culture. Yeah, because it's really uh, difficult to explain, but 
when I was my first time in Arnhem, well, it, I did a trip around Australia, and two parts, uh, two weeks of that was being in Arnhem Land. Uh, and I felt really at home in Arnhem Land, and I didn't know why. And uh, but it was the quietness and the sitting down and smoking cigarettes and have little chats. And I, I don't know how to explain it. It's, you know, because Jormo, the people that uh, I, I hang out with most of the time when I'm there, uh, they have a very strong connection to the country and to their land. And I know I will never be able to fully understand this. I can. Uh, try to try to understand, but I can never feel it. This connection to the land, and then I came home, and in Apeldoorn, which is like the South Park, nothing going on, <laughs> the South Park of Holland, and I realized, hey, if I stand here on Central Station, I can point out my mother's house, and I can point out where my grand grandfather used to live, and it was like, ah, so maybe. This is like, I'm Dutch. Wherever I go, I'm Dutch, you know? And when I'm in Australia, I can still point my mother's house, but I can't point all your own houses. I, it's too much. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's it. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, I would like to say, I think that uh, all three of us, we kind of feel a niche because we all have our backup from I, would, I wouldn't even say indigenous people because I think that's kind of weird. I have my backup from my Hawaiian friends. He has his backup from the digital players. They have this great group of, of Maori people. And I think because um, there are hula groups in the Netherlands, like I said, they learn from YouTube and they don't know what they're doing. And then I think, you know, um, when we perform, we don't, we don't show skin much because people expect from hula, grass skirts, cocoa tops. And skin over here, skin over here, and and that's what what you don't see with us. So people sometimes are surprised or even shocked when they see us dance hula because we perform hula, we perform hula kahiko, which is the um, old hula, old style, and we are covered from neck to toes. And people don't expect that with hula um, because they think hula is erotic and it should be like that. And um, and then they look to Tahiti, which is like 3,000 kilometers south, and that's a completely different culture. So, I, like I said, for us it is, we have to show um, the hula the way they were they're dancing in Hawaii. Of course, when you go to Hawaii and you see um, touristic shows, of course they sell your skin, because that's what people want to see. But if you go to the Halaus, and if you go, if you watch like Paramount Festival, which is all every year around Easter, you don't see any skin. That's not, you don't show skin when you dance hula. Um, and that's, I think that's where, where we fill in, that we show the, the more, more closer to the source than people taking it. Because a lot of people might be playing didgeridoo, and they don't know what they're doing. And so that's where he comes in. And that's where they come in. That's where hope, where we come in. Just say, you know, we're not Hawaiians, but we have the backup from the Hawaiians over there. When I've been in Hawaii, I feel more at home than here. And, and I think, and that, that's hard, um, because not being Hawaiian, but still love their culture, love hula, and uh, that's what we show, so. Yeah. I think there was a question, there are a few questions. I think the person sitting in the middle row was, has been having her hand up for a long time. No, sorry, who was first? Okay, yeah, yeah, actually, go ahead. I do have another question, but yeah. my, my, thank you. My questions actually have been answered by this wonderful discussion. But now I have another one. <laughs> um, and it has to do with ownership of, of knowledge. And it has to do with, on the one hand, I really respect and understand your um, value of you know, the, the depth of what you know about, about the hula. But also, I, I mean, what about the person who may not study hula but loves to learn it on YouTube? And, and, and what about this, I guess, this sort of ownership of this whole question of ownership of culture and who owns it and who owns the knowledge and who owns access to it is kind of what 
where I'm kind of left with this conversation. Okay. Um, and, and it has to do with, you mentioned earlier silences. Um, and I don't know, it was for your, my question all along has been about what, what motivated you to make this exhibition in the first place. And you mentioned silences, and do you feel as a curator that the silences have been addressed, or any of you as, as, the, as the artist, as the participant, do you feel that silences have been addressed? But, but more, my question right now has to do with, and I'm rambling, so I'm sorry, but my question has to do with who is allowed to have access to a tradition? Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I want to say that while well, this project has been, we've been doing this with a, a lot of people, and actually the curator of the exhibition is Erna, <laughs> who's sitting there. Uh, so she, she might be able to uh, talk a little bit more about whether she feels some of the silences have been addressed or not. Um, and, uh, and Yuki, of course, can, can perhaps talk about that as well. Um, in terms of, of ownership, I think this is also what this work is doing. It's, a, it's, an, um, it's an artwork, so it really also opens up a whole kind of bunch of questions uh, where people are left to kind of perhaps a little bit to their own devices and left to think and reflect. Um, and I think this work does this in quite an extraordinary way because it uses the kind of genre of a, of a documentary but it is at the same time an artwork as well. So it leaves you with all these kind of questions and, and ponderings uh, that you might have. And also the kind of self-reflecting uh, idea, I think, is also really important in, in there. So but perhaps Erna can talk about the silences or not. <laughs> I don't know if you want to. <laughs> can, I, can I just, um, is it open? Yeah. Can I just uh, respond to uh, the fact that you said oh, well, everybody can dance hula? Of course you can dance hula. Hula is very open. It's just a matter of interpreting, um, interpreting the language, the, the, the songs. Um, in Hawaii they say, Aoli pauka ike ika halau ho'okahi, which means there, um, you cannot find all knowledge in one school. Every school has their own um, um, Trans the translation to a song and their lineage. And of course, people can dance hula, but um, and learn from 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 um, YouTube, of course. But you should go a little bit more be behind that. If you just want to do it as a gimmick, then then it, it it's 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 almost offensive to uh, to to the culture, because um, one of my students went to see a show, and two of my students are from 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 the states, and they went to um, Halaus in the states. They watched the show, and one of the girls said, "If I would be Hawaiian, I would be offended." And that's where I think, okay, that's where I draw the line. Uh, you can learn from, uh, if you love hula and you like to dance hula and you learn it from YouTube, that's, that's fine. But um, try to do your best. It's, it's not, you should be doing your best to learn and to see where it comes from and not just use it as a means of entertaining because that's, that's a pity because hula is so much deeper than that. Uh. Um. So one thing I, I'll mention before talking about the silences is actually uh, the use, <laughs> if I can put it that way, the, the purpose, I guess, of using an artist such as Yuki, he's a, who's able to reflect on the collections and the issues in such depth and in such a nuanced way, that actually I feel like sometimes it is a far superior way to actually to deal with things that are about policing the boundaries, about policing identity, because it talks about the complexity of, of human relationships, as Peter Pels was talking about before. It's about the relationships. It's not about policing the edges. As soon as you're, you start policing the edges of things, you're putting another person in authority and another decision-making has to go elsewhere instead of a negotiation between individuals and peoples and groups. And I think that's where the investment has been for each of these participants. And the reason I really enjoy Yuki's body of work, but this particular work, is that she gives form to something that has space in it for you to reflect yourself. And so for me, this terrain is being explored in the work. 
and you might come out with a very particular opinion or you might think, oh, that's really complex. And if you come out thinking it's a very nuanced, um, with a more nuanced position than you had when you walked in, then that's a really good thing. That's a result for me. <laughs> and uh, we, I was described as the curator, but uh, I was the curator in, in form, but it's an art installation. So it's an exhibition in this museum, but it's an art installation. It's its own thing. So uh, I, I'd ask you to experience it in that way. So Yuki's very much the boss of this and the, <laughs> the outcome, <laughs> the mastermind. Um, yeah, but the silences, I think, I think the silences are, are what let you have your thoughts, actually, in, in terms of this work. Um, if it leaves you with questions, that's a good thing. And that's, that's actually... Uh, my rebelliousness in the museum is to not be always telling people what to believe, actually to prompt people to ask questions and to reflect. Can I, can I? <clears throat> it's, it's always nice working with Yuki because Yuki is certainly always the boss and she lets you know <laughs> that. There's no question. But I, I think that there is, I think that what I'd love for this conversation though is is that we hold on to the trouble that this presents because it presents a trouble it is not something that because the work emerges in a dis but every time I walk around and I see somebody with locks my first gesture is to put my hand to my chest and I say blessed love because that is how Rasta creates community and every time I put my hand to my chest and the other person doesn't say doesn't even notice me. I'm like, okay then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is something else that's going on there. So, so there is a trouble that this, which is precisely the trouble of the ethnographic museum. Because there is a way in which it also animates the anthropological project, that long history of anthropology, which I always say is fascinating in that it goes to a country to theorize about the multiple possibilities of what is possible, but actually it wouldn't want to live in that country because it is too difficult to live there. So you come back to Europe to live in your niceness where you theorize citizenship through poverty. So it, it animates a trouble that is necessary for us to think through, even while it promises love and engagement and all of that. And so I think that it is nice in between art and anthropology that the tension sits, mm -hmm. that we need to think through. How do we make this? And that's why it's good that it's an art project. Because it's curatorially, if I were to do a project called Going Native, then I probably would lose my job. <laughs> <laughs> but the art project does stimulate something else. But I just want to invite us to hold on to this, because there is no answer yet to where we need to go with this. It's a provocation. And that is what is important, I think. I mean, what I hoped is that I've actually connected the objects to life, to like to real life, um, and um, yeah, I hope you know that that's that's what I really want, um, because I've I've been to many ethnographic museums that describes a culture and a society of people, but sometimes it also lacks the the contemporaneity of um, and and um, you know and and the real life experiences. Um, and that's what I'm trying to achieve. It's like you might see these objects in a museum, but but the, the ideas surrounding the epistemology surrounding these objects are like real thing. They are real things. Um, and then how is that played out in society? And do you have this here? So that's the catch. Anyway, I'm very mindful of time, and I saw I, I saw your hand as well, but uh, I. Saw so on the other hand, first, I think. Um, so if you could uh, ask a, like a brief question. Yeah. Her and Thomas. Well, OK. Um, actually, I have two questions, but maybe we could, you could answer that very quickly. Um, coming back to the question of kinship, um, so, um, Mikkel, I, I uh, you Mikkel. mentioned um, that you were adopted, and I wanted to ask if you could explain why and what that meant for you, what obligation that also had for your work as a musician. 
And the second question, um, we've been looking at this picture for a while now, and I was wondering <laughs> what it's about. What it is about? It's obviously working for um, the exhibition, and I was curious what you were doing there. <laughs> uh, yeah, well. Uh in 2003, I was traveling with my girlfriend at the time. Now she's my wife. And uh, we were sleeping at the family's place in uh, Jirkala, northeast Arnhem Land. And we're share we were sharing the same tent. And this was a little bit awkward because in Yorongu society, everybody and basically everything is connected. So they didn't... I, I was Michiel from Apeldoorn, my girlfriend was Boki from Wageningen and they were like, why are they sleeping in the same tent? And everything is connected, but we didn't have a place in uh, this system. It's a, a system of uh, kinship called Gurutu. And so the only way to put us in place, because Michiel from Apeldoorn doesn't mean a thing. I mean, are you my nephew? Are you my auntie? Are you my mother-in-law? And so the elder couple uh, that was staying at the place adopted, the, the, the man adopted my uh, girlfriend as, her, uh, as his sister, and the lady adopted me as her brother, which immediately made us like uh, uh, from the group that can ma marry each other. So basically it was re really practical. I mean, we were sleeping in the same tent. They know that we're gonna stay for a while. So if we wanna react with, uh, interact with you, then we have to put you in this place of Gurutu. And then I, then I only had two weeks and it happened the last day, I think. <laughs> so I went back to Europe and I started pondering, you know, like, hey, I'm from Apeldoorn and this is my mother and what does this mean for me? And then the first time I came back, uh, I just turned, off, or I turned on my uh, uh, hard drive and as soon as I figured out a personal relationship, like I'm your brother or, you know, because you introduce yourself, hi, I'm Michiel, I'm the brother of this lady. And then the other person will respond, the younger person will respond, okay, then I'm your grandfather. And there's all these uh, different uh, rules between grandfathers and grandsons, between uh, brothers-in-law and mothers-in-law. And I still trying, I mean, I'm a toddler when I'm there. I don't, I d I don't have knowledge, I have information, which I comprehend, try to comprehend. And so when I'm around there, I try to not only memorize the names of everybody, because I have 10,000 uh, people family now, <laughs> but I try to work out our kinship relationship and how I should uh, uh, approach the person or try to understand why they approach me in a certain way. And so, I hope this answers the question. Uh, in, in my work, uh, I'm Michiel from Apeldoorn. Um, with regards to the second question, it will be answered if you when you uh, visit the exhibition. <laughs> yeah, um, Thomas, Mike. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Thomas. Hello, everyone. Very humble to be here uh, because it's always nice to be able to talk about cultural exchange uh, as the project from the Waka grabbed us. Uh, people know me that keeping it short is difficult for me, but I'll try. Yuki, I know you will take the mic from me. Um, I'll do one story and then I have a question about it. Um, for the Wakas, there's a lot of meaning. Everything we talked about, you can, for me personally, you can grab it in one word, which is the, the connection of people. It's a long thing that we've lost a long time. And for us, um, I can't speak for everyone, but this Waka connected us to ourselves more, to another people as well. Uh, we were asked to guard these Wakas in their state and their being. So we tried to keep them safe according to how Maori would do that. That's a difficult job because, uh, you know, it's a long way um, to go to New Zealand. But that's what cultural integrity is for. Uh, which forces you to ask the questions that were asked today about ownership or about consumerism. I would thought that was a very good uh, question because that's a very big discussion of what is not and what is. Um, um, and it's important to 
guard those limits and guard those lines. And for us, we keep them safe as living things. Um, but also we deal with, of course, with um, not every Maori in New Zealand will agree right away with what we do. We've already experienced that. Um, most of the time that goes actually goes quite well, especially because of the people that we are connected with, Heke Nukumai, uh, uh, Na Iwi Puipi, the Waka Builder, but also the uh, Joe Conrad, the chief of Nato Kimata Faurua, and also the, but also predominantly the way we do things. We try to do it wholeheartedly. So like Kos already stated, it's not like, okay, you do this and then you're okay. No, it's the way we do it. It's the way we feel it. It's the way we talk about it. It's the way we love it and the people that we want to share it with or we are allowed to share it with. I have a question to the, to like I know Mirta and I know Wonu, but I don't, for you two gentlemen, um, how do you deal with, um, with, well, I don't mean it in a harsh way, but how do you deal with skeptics? People who challenge you on your, um, your motives, challenge you on your knowledge and challenge you on if this is right or not. Um, because um, it's good that people are skeptic, because that keeps you, for my perspective, because it keeps you self-reflecting on what you do and how you do things. So I was curious about how you deal and how you uh, talk to people who are very skeptic, and how do you uh, address them as well? Because I think that's a very important element of what we do here in cultural exchange. That because it again it keeps you sharp and reflective of what we do and how we do it. So that would be my question. Thank you. Uh, that's all. <laughs> you try to keep it short. Now I have tried <laughs> to try to keep it short. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, no worries. Uh, the most uh, s uh, skeptical people in the didgeridoo scene, because uh, uh, don't. Uh, uh, are not really skeptical towards me fr uh, from Australia because there's much worse going on. <laughs> uh, within Yorongo society, uh, you know, I, I have one thing in mind, especially when I do uh, public uh, performances, is that I always try to keep it real in a way that would I say this or would I play this if there would be a traditional master coming into this room? And if the wa ma answer is no, then I wouldn't do it. And if the master walks in, then I would just leave the stage and say, you're the master. At the same time, I'm Michiel and I make mistakes, but I can also explain why I made this mistake. I mean, uh, I just get into a conversation with this person and so far, uh, yeah, I didn't have too much critique from Northeast Arnhem Land people. Um, same thing for me. I'm, uh, I've been dancing hula for 42 years in the Netherlands. People know me. Um, and not in a bad way. They know what I'm doing. And um, also in, other, in, in Germany. And uh, I give workshops uh, sometimes in, in, in Spain. Um, same as what, what Michiel says. If there's Hawaiians, hula is humble. Humility. So you have to always be humble. And if there's, an, if there's Hawaiians, are there any Hawaiians in here? No. Good. Um, if there's Hawaiians, of course, I always take a back step because I know my, I always say from the mile of hula, I walked a few meters because there's so much to learn. If I go to a workshop and you ask, what did you learn? I say, the more I learn, the less I know because it's like an oil spill. If I learn this, I want to learn, I want to know all about it. So there's so much to learn. So cynicals, of course you have cynicals. But when I'm in Hawaii, I've been to Hawaii a lot of times. Like I said, I have more Hawaiian friends in Hawaii than in, in on this hemisphere, this side of the world. Um, they uh, respect me and they know I have respect for the Hawaiians over there. So um, cynical, you can, people can always be cynical, but is that, um, is that is, that's their problem, I think. Um, can I just say that like the biggest group of people that exploit Pacific culture are Pacific Islanders themselves. They are the worst corporates. So I've seen worse. And on that note, on that note <laughs> Harry, what are we going to do? Yeah, I, d I don't know how, we're, um, how we are for time. How much time do you need, you well, think? Well, 
you, Yuki kind of ordered me to teach you dance, but I think <laughs> sharing is a form of care. So everybody, you're gonna get up. Well, so so, okay. So so Hula is just Hula is just interpreting um, the lyrics. Um, I think I should just dance it. I'll tell you, it, it's in, it's in English, so you can make the connection between the words and the hand movements. I'll just gonna dance it, and if you can maybe follow the movements. Um, and this, we'll see where that ends, okay? <laughs> it's called Soft Green Seas, and it's uh, just a song that someone wrote because he went to Hawaii, and when he left, he uh, dismissed Hawaii. <laughs> 